Okay, this video is Chapter 5, Epidemiology, from this book, The Medical Reformation, Vegan Renaissance Bible by me. Okay, so we're going to talk about epidemiology, and like I said, the key things that doctors don't learn in medical school is NET, N-E-T, nutrition, epidemiology, and toxicology. And those are the three most important things. And also, you heard me say it before, I think all this mathematics and physics and physical chemistry, it's a big joke, okay? They just waste people's time. It's got nothing to do with medicine, all right? Okay, so starting out in epidemiology, I showed a picture of Cicero. And at this time, he was denouncing Catiline. This is a big thing. If you ever want to study Roman history, just study Cicero. If you just study Cicero, he'll connect you to everything else. Um, Okay, so Caesar's, Cicero said, to not know what happened before you were born is to forever remain a child. And yes, learning some nutritional history, it really helps you to be able to make sense out of stuff. And you kind of know where um, a lot of the doctrines come from. Oh, here's some other good quotes from Cicero real quick. It's hard to pass these up. All right, Cicero said, the Republic, when we inherit it, inherited it, was like a beautiful painting whose colors were already fading with age. But our own time not only has neglected to freshen it by renewing the original colors, but has not even bothered to preserve its forms and outlines. What now is left of the ancient customs on which the commonwealth of Rome was firmly founded is they have been so utterly buried in oblivion that not only are they no longer practiced, but they are forgotten. Yeah, and it reminded me, um, you know, Dalrymple had a quote about the uh, English people. He said, the, the moderns are inferior to their ancestors, and they walk around in the ruins of a culture that was superior to their own. And that's kind of like what, what Cicero was saying about his Rome, too. So the first 500 years of Rome is largely the Republic. Um, and then it sort of really transitioned to being an empire and whatnot. And uh, Cicero was right in the middle of the turning point. Okay, he, he was, Cicero is the greatest of all the Romans ever. He's the best Roman. Uh, he was a great orator. Lots of good stuff uh, came from Cicero. I brought him up for the sake of talking about history. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Oh, as far as like, if you want to read one book about epidemiology, you don't even need to read the book. Just go watch the videos for Dan Butner of National Geographic. So he talks about what were referred to as the Blue Zones. He was a writer for National Geographic. They picked out what they felt were the five healthiest populations, had the most people in their 90s and 100s who were still physically fit and mentally sharp. Um, and he said on his original videos that they ate 95% or more plant-based. On his more recent videos, he starts saying 90%. And that's a common thing that people will tell you more close to the truth when they start out. And then they sort of get pressured and start wimping out the more time goes by. And moving from 95 to saying 90% plant-based. Okay, um, they all walked around a lot. They all had a strong sense of family and community. They were all religious. Um, all of them kind of lived, you know, sort of in a relatively rural place, except for the Seventh-day Adventists who live in Loma Linda, a suburb of Los Angeles. Uh, the other thing is, you know, this modern world stuff, diversity getting all hyped up. It's actually, you know, like I said, divided, like Rome, divide and conquer is more like what it really means. All these communities were relatively uh, tight-knit, and they shared their cultural traditions and in close-knit communities, relatively homogeneous ethnic groups with a shared religion and whatnot. Um, one thing Dan Buettner really was pretty positive about was eating beans. There's a little controversy about that. I think there's a lot of good things about beans, all the fiber and all that, but they're a little high in protein, about 30% protein. Some people really wonder if it's best to be about as low in protein as you can get. If you eat most plant-based diets, you end up somewhere around 80, 10, 10. You're still far, far ahead of the crowd that's eating, um, that's eating a lot of meat and processed food. And they'll often say that, oh, the meat and processed food groups only eat about 16% protein. I don't believe that. You know, salmon's 50-50. And I've seen a lot of people eat a lot of meat. I bet they're eating more than that so-called 16% protein. And they're eating far, far more fat. Pritikin had said the two main categories of diets are high fat and low fat. That's sort of the main variable. Pritikin, of course, is very much interested in the low fat book. So this, of course, is a picture of Dan Buettner. He seems pretty nice. I like you know, what I've seen of him. I think he's a little bit light on alcohol. I think alcohol is worse for people than he lets on for it to be. And I think... He overrates beans a little bit, but I think he's pretty good. 
Okay, um, here is the picture of the dividing line between Mexico and the United States. These populations, the Tatahumata of Mexico and the Pima, used to be associated with each other. After the Mexican-American War in 1848, the Pima got pulled into Arizona, and now they eat sort of an Americanized diet or a sad diet, standard American diet. Tatahumata stayed in northern Mexico in the area called the Sierra Madre Mountains, Copper Canyon area. They eat more of their traditional diet, a lot of corn, um, some beans, uh, local greens, some squash. Corn's their main uh, staple, the most of their calories. And they're very unique. They'll run over 100 miles in two days. And Nathan Pritikin patterned his diet after them. He was so impressed by their extraordinary energy. And that's not just a fast guy. It's like every guy in town can run 100 miles in two days. A lot of uh, ultra-marathon runners have gone out there. Ruth Hydrich went out there and some of these other ultra marathon or runner guys have gone out there. Okay. All right, and they have the other guy, and I think his name was Bill Connor, went out there and he was impressed by their health. He checked all their blood labs. So here's a picture just comparing, you know, the Tatahumata versus the Pima. And the Tatahumata, like I said, the world famous ultra marathoners, super healthy, versus the Pima, you know, they're a disaster. They're worse than the average American in their health, you know, fat diabetic, all the usual stuff, atherosclerosis, you turn the diabetes, end up getting foot amputations, then leg amputations, disaster, disaster, disaster. So TBI, you know, of course it means traumatic brain injury, but in this context it can also mean total body ischemia, okay? And just have one disaster after another, you know, all these train tracks are surgical scars. So, you know, and you only get one life, why do you want to spend it being sick? I mean, sometimes sick sickness is bad luck, but most of the time, it's just bad habits, bad diet. Okay, um, and Pritikin has said there's no such thing. There's no natural occurring diet that's too low in fat. Fat's bad. You want to minimize it as best you can. Okay, another uh, epidemiology population for us to look at is the Yanomamo in South America, the Amazon jungle overlapping Brazil and Venezuela. You know, they get about 200 or so milligrams of sodium a day. They eat a plant-based diet out in the wild. A lot of fiber, they eat a lot of wild bananas, and basically they don't get hypertensive. Here's one paper about them, the Yanomami Intersalt Study. Okay, and you know, persons who eat a plant-based diet and don't add salt to their, their diet, they, you know, have about the same blood pressure from when they're born to they get older. You know, they don't go much up over 110, over 70. Um, and so that's good. If you don't have high blood pressure, then you don't tend to get atherosclerosis. Okay, here's another epidemiology population in Kenya. And so in Kenya, um, they eat a predominantly plant-based diet. And that was the other one, too. The big paper for them is 1929. The author's name is Donison. It's in the Lancet Journal. And it was something like uh, blood pressure in the African native. And the gist of it was 1,800 consecutive admissions. And there was no high blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas in the United States, if you had the same population, 1,800 consecutive admissions in adults, you'd probably have about, you know, 70% hypertensive or more. Um, the other thing, too, is, you know, like when I was in residency, med school, uh, fellowship, you know, we were sort of taught blacks have a lot of hypertension. Nobody really knows exactly why. It's probably genetic, you know, maybe from the hot climate in Africa, something related to that. You know, it's real difficult to treat. Very sad. What are you going to do? You walk into a dialysis unit, you'll see lots of blacks all there from, predominantly there from hypertension. Okay, there's other causes of kidney failure as well. But the point I'm saying is, then I started reading about it, and you know, I'll tell you, that Richard Moore wrote about it, really interesting stuff. And what he basically said was, look, like I just mentioned the Donison article, none of them had hypertension back when they were eating a plant-based diet. <laughs> Zero out of eight, 1,800. All right. And then what Richard Moore said from his research and study of the topic is that he doesn't think it's either from sodium either. He says that if you compared them to other populations, they weren't eating that much more sodium. The big difference was they were eating hardly any potassium. So they lost the potassium vasodilator. They're probably real low in magnesium as well. And he didn't, I don't recall him commenting on that. So, and then of course you get nitrate precursors from green. So basically all the good stuff comes from plants. P for plants, P for potassium. Magnesium is in the center of chlorophyll, and the plants, like the greens in particular, have the nitrate precursors that get converted in your mouth to nitrites and your stomach to nitric oxide, systemic vasodilator. So, and also go get some sunshine, you know. 
You get subcutaneous uh, nitric oxide precursors released into your blood for vasodilation. Just like when you, you walk out in the sun, you get that pleasant feeling. So all the good stuff comes from plants. All the bad stuff from processed food and you know meats, not so much good stuff. Okay, um, so that's the answer. That's what they need to do is eat more plants. You know, it's not rocket science. And the fact that hardly anybody knows that, <laughs> millions and millions of people die because of that. Millions and millions all the time. And nobody knows it. And I got all, I also got news to you. I know lots of doctors and lots of other people in the healthcare business. No one ever invites me to talk. And they know, and it's funny. They all talk to me personally. They say, oh, that's great. That's great. That's great. Thank you for teaching me. Thank you for teaching me. But I never get invited to speak in from a group because, you know, this type of knowledge, there's no money in it. And nobody really cares about all these poor people, okay? There's, there's no money in helping poor people. There really isn't. It's kind of bizarre, but it's true. Uh, help the insurance company and the drug company. You'll get some money. Help the patients. They got no money. Um, you might get yourself in trouble for helping the patients. Piss people off. Okay, so here's the book. Best book ever written on high blood pressure. Especially the, the greatest thing about this book was, of course, he goes through a lot of epidemiology and basically says what I said. Uh, he says that basically if the populations eat what they should, a lot more uh, potassium than uh, sodium, at least five times more, you know, preferably you're going to be like 10 or more times. If you're eating a plant-based diet, you'll get far more. I think our ancestors probably ate about 25 to 1 potassium to sodium. But anyways, just getting that plant-based diet, you should handle the problem pretty well. Once, the more chronic the hypertension, the more damage to the arterial walls with, you know, laying down of collagen, you know, smooth muscle, vascular smooth muscle hypertrophy and whatnot, and then eventually calcification, the harder it is to reverse it. The more you've lost the Windkessel effect in the ascending thoracic aorta. So, the sooner you get your act together, the better, the less likely all this stuff is going to progress. I gave, I gave a couple lectures about him, too. And sort of what I'm doing with this, with this book and with this course is I'm trying to give you a course in nutrition. This is really kind of like a comprehensive nutrition course, and I'm covering all the stuff that doesn't usually get covered. That certainly doesn't get covered in like a typical, you know, university or in a typical um, medical school, graduate school of any type. Okay, um, he especially is great for going over the ion pumps, you know, potassium and sodium. Most Americans eat the opposite of our ancestors. Let's say our ancestors is a, let's just call it 20 times as much potassium as sodium. I think it's probably closer to 25, but let's call it 20 to make it easier to work with the numbers. Nowadays, we eat almost the opposite, about 10 times as much sodium as potassium. And that's a major reason why people are so hypertension, so hypertensive. More, you know, the author of this book, he especially emphasizes, you know, the excess sodium and the lack of potassium and hypertension. Dr. McDougall tends to do the opposite. He tends to emphasize um, excess dietary fat causing high blood pressure, and he thinks sodium is less important. But, you know, it also is a matter of degrees, and Kempner would talk about a threshold effect, meaning that if you just bump down your sodium intake from 4,000 milligrams a day to 3,000 milligrams a day, not that big of a difference. But if you take from 4,000 down to 500, you see a much bigger benefit. Okay, McDougall says, ah, you got to let people put a little salt on their food or they won't eat the plant foods. So it's, it's a minor problem in his opinion. In his opinion, the big poisons are animal foods and oils, okay? And these other things are minor issues. And, you know, a lot of people, it's hard to get them to do anything. But, you know, for you yourself, if you're motivated, you know, why not minimize your dietary sodium and uh, try to get the best possible results? Okay, um, another thing pointed out was, well, gee, the Japanese were relatively healthy in the 1960s and lived relatively long despite eating lots of sodium and despite smoking tobacco. So that's another reason why they think animal foods and oils are worse than smoking tobacco or sodium. But... You know, the Okinawans were healthier than the mainland Japanese, let's say, in the 1960s and 70s. And it's thought that that's probably because the Okinawans ate a lot less salt. Okay, here's a book about Walter Kempner and the rice diet. And I'll tell you, a lot of neurologists, I've never met a nephrologist who knows about this. <laughs> and they all should know about this. I mean, the guy's big goal was to help save the kidney failure patients. There was no dialysis when he was starting out. So they all died. And he kept a lot of them alive a long time. This book, Walter Kempner and the Rice Diet, it was written by Barbara Newberg. She was a physician who worked with Kempner, making rounds with him every day, taking care of the patients. So she really knows him pretty well. And it's a good book. You know, she goes on and on a little bit, gossiping about all their friends and who lived where and all this stuff. But it's still a good book. She goes through a lot of the medical stuff. And it's good. It's a good book. 
And again, I made lectures about Kempner, and then I made Kempner revisited lectures and stuff. And at Dr. McDougall's uh, website, is he's got Kempner's research papers. There's like books part one and part two. Um, that's quite interesting to read. Kempner took care of about 19,000 patients. He had incredible results. McDougall called him, he thinks, the greatest doctor who ever lived. The guy was a genius. He's sort of an internal medicine doctor who specialized in kidneys. He did research in kidneys. He had his training with Otto Warburg, who was real precise in measurements. That's a German guy who won the Nobel Prize in 1931 and discovered and figured out that hypoxia induces cancer. That's called the Warburg effect. Um, Sodium is a vasoconstrictor, so it also decreases perfusion of tissue. That's another reason why he wanted to get that down, not just because of the high blood pressure, but to improve perfusion to the kidneys. Okay, Kemner had lots of people that lost over 100 pounds of weight. Um, he mostly just fed them rice. Rice is only 1% of calories from fat. He fed, them, he fed them a little bit of fruits and fruit juice. Okay, let me, let me shrink my uh, picture here. Um, what he was really trying to do, though, Rice about seven or eight percent protein. Uh, fruits are real low in protein. It's a way to minimize dietary protein to decrease the workload of the kidneys. He would even give people who weren't getting enough calories just simple sugar. Again, because carbo pure carbohydrate has no nitrogen. The goal is to protect the kidneys. And also, he had shown that his diet type two diabetic patients did fantastic. So that's why people say don't feed carbs or sugar to, to diabetics. Don't feed fruits to diabetics. They're wrong. Okay. You know, the Mastering Diabetes guys are pretty good talking about this. Both of those guys, you know, like Bobby Bitteru, Cyrus Wombata, something like that. Uh, they're relatively young, those guys. I would ballpark them, and they're about 30 to 40 years of age now. They both had type 1, or really I think type 1.5 diet is what it seems to me, type diabetes. And they both eat lots of fruit, and they're doing great. I, th I think they're good. I, th I like them. I think they're smart. So that's one other spot you can get information if you're interested in diabetes. Um... Let's see, Kempner's diet was remarkably low in sodium. He did all kinds of things, like he would extra rinse the rice another time to get any sodium possibly off it. Um, he had some patients bring their blood pressure down from as high as like around 230 down to normal, the low 100s. Okay, um, in Kempner, you know, they had the people coming to what they call the rice houses, which were just like... Um, little mini apartments that stay while he was out at Duke University, North Carolina, Durham, North Carolina, and he had tons of patients. He, he, was, he was the main money maker for the whole hospital. Uh, he was a multimillionaire, kind of like the rock star of nutrition therapy medicine of all time. And so the people would go to weigh-ins, um, they would the ones who lost 100 pounds. They get their name up on the wall. They would write their blood pressures on the wall. So it kind of created a social pressure and competition. And it was a great way to lose weight. They go for nice walks around Durham and get some exercise. But I think he, I, I actually think one mistake of Kempner. He didn't educate educate the patients as much as he could have. Because I've read the memoirs and books of people who went there and they loved it while they were there. But a lot of them regained the weight when they went off on their own. So more education and teaching could have improved that. They often had to go back there to re-lose the weight and get it all off. It's real boring. McDougall calls it the diet for the nearly dead. And the patients tend to not like it. Obviously, eating white rice all day, every day would make you bored. Um, let's see. Other foods with only 1% of their calories from fat, the other starches, would be potatoes and sweet potatoes. And so people who eat that, they're skinny. Like the you know Chinese before 1980, they're all a billion out of a billion of them are a bunch of toothpicks eating this rice all the time. And the other Asian countries where they ate a lot of rice were quite skinny, like the Japanese and the Koreans and whatnot. Um, potatoes are more complete food. It comes out of the ground. And people could live on a diet of almost entirely sweet potatoes and potatoes. The Papua New Guinea would eat 93% of their calories from sweet potatoes. The Okinawans a long time ago, they used to eat tons of potatoes. By the way, Okinawa now is they got all these fast food places in there and they're fat and sick like everybody else. So uh, these places get ruined with the modern food. Okay, um, here's a normal retina, you know, eye exam, you look with the ophthalmoscope, and um, a lot of the diabetic retinopathy, some of the hypertensive retinopathy, you know, Kempner showed that they could dramatically improve with, uh, with his diet, and people didn't realize that before. They even accused him of switching the order of the pictures. Um, he had great results with type 2 uh, diabetes and with hypertension, and so like I said, too, you know, 
conventional medicine never cures type 2 diabetes or hypertension. Low-fat vegan diet cures it all the time. You know, different people will quote you different numbers. Kempner had extremely high uh, cure rates. Um, Kempner or McDougall will quote you about 90% for hypertension uh, to low-fat vegan diet. And, of course, it depends when you catch the patient. You know, the sooner you catch them, the less chronic damage they have to their arterial walls, to the beta cells of their pancreas, for example, to their ascending thoracic aortic elastic fibers. Okay, here's just a little bit of joke. Kempner, you know, had multiple girlfriends, almost like having his own harem, okay? <laughs> Guy's a multimillionaire, and he was supposedly a really nice guy, too, but uh, he ended up getting in trouble for being accused of whipping a patient. I don't know what happened. I wasn't there. Apparently, for noncompliance, she wanted him to. I don't know what happened. But like I said, he's sort of like the rock star legend guy of nutritional medicine. Okay, there weren't any good uh, antihypertensive medications in those days. There wasn't any uh, dialysis machine. Um, let's see here. Okay, the next thing to talk about is, and by the way, the story with, with uh, epidemiology is always pretty much the same thing. The more low-fat plants they eat, the healthier they are. All right, the more meat, oil, whatever they eat, the sicker they are. And you take the same people. It's got nothing to do with genetics. You take the Japanese in mainland Japan when they're eating. Uh, basically, you could take it. You could start with a Japanese person in Okinawa. Move them to mainland Japan where they eat more salt. They get a little bit sicker. Then move them to Hawaii where they start eating more fat and they get sicker. Then move them to mainland United States and they eat more oil and, and meat and fat, and they keep getting sicker and sicker and fatter and fatter. And it's pretty much, it's always like that. There's other populations where they've done similar studies. Okay, and this one right here, uh, first of all, Norway, you know, during rationing, during like World War II, World War I, uh, when they ration the population so they get less meat, less fat, they tend to be skinnier and healthier despite the psychological stress of the difficult times. Um, then when they get the meat back after the wars are over and the food's more abundant, they start getting fat and sick again. Finland in particular, there was a guy by the name of Pekka Puska. He's a doctor, and it was especially in a province of Finland called Karelia. And he basically had them stop smoking, decrease their intake of meat and dairy. Uh, they switched out their salt shakers of sodium for, like, potassium chloride. Um, they taught the wives how to cook, to, you know, to lower their cardiovascular risk. Uh, they gave them frozen uh, fruits all year round, so they started eating more fruits. And they had a drop between 1972 to 1977 of 84% in their cardiovascular mortality. That's an incredible drop. I mean, the highest you could get, uh, that's, that's an incredible number, by the way. The highest you, um, amount you could get would be 100% loss, and they did it, okay? So that, that's remarkable, a remarkable improvement. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, uh, Roy Swank noticed that in Norway, in the coastal areas where they didn't have much dairy, they had very low incidence of MS, but more centrally in Norway, in the center of the country, they had a lot more multiple sclerosis where they also had a lot more dairy. And that was one of the points Swang went. He said, it's not this latitude stuff. Because you'll hear other people say, well, gee, the more you go closer to the equator, the hotter it gets, people get more vitamin D, more sunshine, and they have less uh, MS or less autoimmune disease in general. But the confounding variable is the closer they get to the equator, the more plant foods they eat. And that appears to be by far the more important thing. And that's what Swank pointed out. He said the latitude is not that different between central Norway and coastal Norway. But there was a big difference in their MS incidence. And you'll also hear Swank said, you know, he went to China around 1960 and he couldn't find anybody with multiple sclerosis because they didn't have almost any dairy back in those days. There's videos. You go online, you'll find videos about Finland and Pekapuska. The Plant Chompers guy made a pretty good video about Pekapuska and Finland. Um, Dr. Schwank's got good videos on Dr. McDougall's channel. Um, I've made videos about all this stuff as well, but those are some other good places to look. I would say if you look at McDougall's videos, he tends to be talking like to an intelligent layperson, you know, or somebody maybe an IQ of about 100 to 110. My videos in general are more advanced. I go into more uh, detailed information. You know, I'm really sort of gearing it to the, like a little IQ level about 120 to 140. And some people say, well, why do I make them so advanced or whatever? And I'm like, well, look, 
only a motivated, intelligent person is going to find my YouTube channel, okay? Hardly anybody knows about me. So I'm just trying to be good. I'm, I'm never going to be popular, okay? But I do think I can be good. I actually think I could be the best nutrition doc in, in the world on the Internet just because I've noticed there's not that much good stuff out there. I mean, there are good channels. There are good people. Yes, I get all of that. But I just noticed there's nobody like me. And that's why I feel like I need to be on here. Okay, you know, guys like Caldwell Asselson, T. Colin Campbell, they're great. Ornish, they're great. Okay, and they're great researchers, all right? But they don't tend to go over a wide variety of topics in detail. And again, most people are speaking at the level of like they're trying to simplify everything. But I think there's a good benefit to add in more detail. Okay, and I'll go through a big variety of stuff and I'll go into a bunch of subjects nobody else wants to touch. Okay, plus, there's tremendous peer pressure to promote all this high-fat junk food, in my opinion. Soy, omega-3 fats, olive oil, canola oil, nuts, seeds, etc. Okay, and then all the processed food nonsense, MSG, and then these supplements, omega-3s, coffee. All right, so um, let's see. We talked about all this other stuff. Let's see. Yeah, if a fat 50-year-old walks into a doctor's office... Right away, you know the guy's going to have probably high cholesterol, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, maybe a high fasting blood glucose, pre-diabetic or diabetic, hemoglobin A1C elevated. So you can quickly get him on about five or more medicines, and he takes those every day for life. You're basically like milking a cow making money off the guy. You teach him low-fat vegan, and he cures himself. You don't make any money off that, okay? Um and the meds don't work well. Eventually they fail worse and worse, and the guy goes for some type of surgery or invasive procedure. McDougal had a good line. He called the treadmill stress test a conveyor belt to the cath lab. Yeah, and it's pretty common that then they go for a cath, and then they tell me that you need a stent or you need open-heart surgery, and they often tell me, oh, you've got a widow maker. That's like what they told my old man, and I tried to talk him out of it, but I didn't know enough back then. And we talked about this already. Stents, you know, in the ballpark, 20000 or more dollars, open-heart surgery altogether, about 120000 or more uh, all the billing. So, you know, teaching somebody low-fat vegan diet, you know, I do it for free on the internet. If you have them come for a course, you maybe get one or two thousand bucks out of them. Not that much. You don't get reimbursed by insurance typically. So, like I said, I did a fellowship uh, with the emphasis on vascular disease. And I never once ever heard the vegan site mentioned. Never once or any type of diet really. And I was talking to vascular interventionalists, cardiac uh, surgeons, vascular surgeons, and um, cardiologist all the time, every week, multiple times. So it just was not there. And so there it is, the most powerful thing. And Esselstyn had commented on that. He says, it's amazing. The most common cause of death in the United States, and none of the doctors understand it, and none of them provide an adequate treatment. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Okay. Um, and like I said, I taught all myself all this stuff on my own for just reading and then later on watching internet videos. Okay. I went through all that stuff before. Okay, a little more of this stuff. Oh, I kind of alluded to this earlier. The Okinawans. Okinawa is sort of like what Hawaii is to the United States. Okinawa is sort of that to Japan. Uh, they talked about the Japanese migrant studies. The more they travel towards the USA, the sicker they get. The relatively unique Seventh Day Adventists, often abbreviated SDA, the they're they all tend to have pretty good habits. They tend not to smoke. They tend to get some exercise. They like going on hikes outdoors together. They have good communities. They're real Christian. Um, they tend to they have the longest lived lives of any well documented patients. Um, with the women living about eighty eight point six years, close to eighty nine years. Men living eighty five years. Average Californian at that time was about ten years less. For both, for the men and for the women. So you're probably getting about 10 extra years of life. You eat and live that way and uh, maybe longer than that in terms of good health years. And McDougall was working with that population too and he said a lot of them were really sort of religious vegetarians or vegans rather than health vegetarians or vegan, meaning that they weren't all low fat, so to speak, so that they could do better than that. So if everybody does everything right, they probably can expect them to have an average life of about 90 years, maybe 95 would be a reasonable estimate. Uh, nobody knows for sure. Okinawans were sort of second longest lived in the world, and that's what got them there, you know. Low-fat plant-based diets. 
And the other thing, too, is you'll sometimes run into all these posers and BS artists on the Internet trying to tell you, oh, carno or vor keto, paleo is a good diet, et cetera, et cetera. And the way you can kind of put them in their place real fast <clears throat> is just say, look, the only diet ever shown to reverse coronary artery disease is a low-fat, low-sodium vegan diet. It's low-fat vegan diet, okay, like the Esselstyn diet. And to some extent, the Ornish diet was like a related project. That's it, okay? Um, and whenever you look at these epidemiology comparisons, the vegan diet always wins. Like, look at the seven-day Adventists, the so-called omnivores, then the sort of vegetarians, lacto-ovo, pesco, vegetarian, and then the vegans. The vegans are the best. They're the skinniest, and they have the least diabetes, typical things like that. And whenever you don't see it match that way, you know that somebody messed with the study. Because whenever they go back and look at it in more detail, they see somebody messed with the data or the sample set, the cohort, in some way. Okinawans ate a lot of greens. Um, they were eating at that time about 85% carbohydrates, 9% protein, only 6% of their calories from fat. Like we said, you, it's impossible to be too low in fat or protein. So just forget about it. Try to minimize them and forget about it is what I do. Um, and that's recommended based on my experience, McDougall's experience as well, and the studies that they quote, uh, Pritikin went through all this stuff in great detail. That guy was a genius, and he put a lot of time into reviewing all the literature. This is a book written by a couple of brothers. One of them is an MD, Bradley Wilcox, and his brother uh, Craig Wilcox is a PhD. They went and lived in Japan, worked with this Japanese doctor, uh, Dr. Makoto Suzuki, to figure out why were the Okinawans so healthy. And their low-fat diet also protected them from cancer. Um, they had a much lower incidence of cancer. Okay, we talked about the migrant study. Here's a paper, too. You can look it up if you want. Okay, and so it, it's always going to be that same pattern. The, the low-fat plant eaters, they're the healthiest, all right? Um, it goes that way over and over and over for all these different populations. People say, well, what about the Maasai? Aren't the Maasai healthy? No, they did an autopsy on them. They get lots of exercise, which partially compensates for it, but they had tons of atherosclerosis. And the Eskimos are not healthy either, eating all the fish, and they had lots of osteoporosis and other problems. Oh, and then another thing sometimes comes up. Well, we talked about, I'll, I'll get into him more, uh, Japanese neuroscientist Tetsumori Yamashima later. He showed why nowadays that Japanese are eating more and more oil in their food. They're getting much, much sicker. And he, he did a lot of good research on that. It ends up being called the Cathepsin caspase theory of neurodegeneration related to cooking oils, omega-6 cooking oils. Um, so, like Esselstyn says, he's right. Never eat oil. No oil, not one drop. The other thing is, like people say to me, why are you so extreme, so absolutist? Why do you insist on no oil, not one drop? Because it's either that or failure, okay? I've seen a lot of bad things. All these people who say I'm cutting down, whenever somebody says, oh, I'm cutting down, I always think to myself, lazy, mediocre, pathetic chump, you're probably not going to make it, okay? You quit oil. You don't cut down on oil. You quit meat. You don't cut down on it. You quit dairy. You don't cut down on it. Just because it's like an alcoholic saying, I only drink once in a while. If you've been sick and if you've been to the point where you're potentially becoming impotent or having cardiac symptoms, you know, you're at risk for a lethal event, okay? And you've had a previous stroke. So don't mess around. All these diabetics, uh, atrial fibrillation patients, and these cancer patients, don't mess around. Your life's precious, and you could hit a point of irreversible damage, like a big stroke or something, and you know it's harder to turn things around at that point. Okay, so anyways, well, the reason why I'm kind of like Old Testament, thou shalt not do this or that, because that's what works. You want to work. Like, you've heard this before. You don't tell an alcoholic you can drink on the weekends. You don't tell a smoker you can smoke on the weekends. They have to quit doing it, you know? You don't tell your new spouse they can, you know, see their, uh, their old uh, squeeze on the weekends. No, they stop doing that, okay? All right, so we talked about this already. Standard American diet, paleo, keto, all that stuff. You're screwed, all the fat. You end up with lots of atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease. All of these people saying how great paleo, keto, carnivore is. They got to keep all the low IQ chumps eating that junk food, keep them fat and sick, okay? Those are diets are for chumps. All the studies I've seen that show long-term follow-up on them, they all have poor outcomes and increased mortality. Um, and we talked about this already, the, the rice diet of Japan, Korea, China, they do relatively well, okay, despite the smoking. <laughs> and nowadays, though, they don't really eat this anymore, but they did relatively well. The smoking and the high sodium led to a lot of hypertension and strokes from that. The diet of India, you know, they have a lot of plant foods, and that's good, but they often eat a lot of uh, fried foods, and that tends to get them in trouble. Low-fat, low-sodium vegan diet is the best. They're better off, like, for every health category. Um, 
And yeah, there's tons more stuff that we didn't go into. The Simani is a population that ate largely predominantly plant-based. They had the best cardiac calcium scores. If you go back and you look at the uh, Egyptians, uh, the mummies, you know, the rich ones that were rich enough to become mummified, they would have coronary artery and uh, aorta, atherosclerosis calcifications. They dug up a bunch of graveyards in Europe for construction purposes, and where the aristocrats were buried, they had a lot more manifestations. For example, in their spine of dish, diffuse idiopathic scuttle hyperostosis, which is associated with obesity, uh, diabetes, and hypertension. And then you dig up the graves of where the, the peasants are buried, the ones that are eating turnips. Uh, they had much less uh, dish, suggesting they were much less obese, much less diabetes, atherosclerosis, and whatnot. Okay, so that's the end of Chapter 5 on Epidemiology. Hope that was helpful.